from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, um, and I wish you all the warmest of welcomes on behalf of our chief, Dr. Mary De Jane Deeb, who is unable to be with us today because she's uh, in uh, South Africa, and on behalf of all my colleagues in the African Middle Eastern Division, again, I wish you the warmest of welcomes. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section here in the African Middle Eastern Division. The division consists of three sections. The African section, whose staff is concerned with developing the collection from and about Sub-Saharan Africa, and whose staff provides reference access to the collections. Uh, the Hebraic section, whose staff is responsible for developing the collection in Hebraica and Judaica worldwide, and whose staff provides uh, access to those collections and the Near East section, of which I said I'm head. The Near East section has responsibility for developing a collection from and about all of the Arab world, 22 Arab countries, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, uh, the Iranian world of Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, uh, the countries of the Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, and Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans. Or one can say it in sort of city terms, our area of responsibility uh, stretches from Casablanca in the west to Kashgar in the east, from Kazan in the north to Khartoum in the south. Um, the section's collection is about 480,000 volumes. About one half are in Arabic. There are 75 to 80,000 volumes each in Persian and Turkish. There are now approximately 40,000 volumes in Armenian. And the remaining volumes, I guess I can be heard better now, and the remaining volumes are in some 36 other languages, uh, many from the Caucasus, but also languages such as Kurdish and Pushtu. Now, as I mentioned, the staff is also responsible for creating and assisting uh, with reference access to the collection and the use of the collection. And one of the ways in which we do that are through these presentations in which a staff member learns of a, a recent publication, often through the authors who have been doing work in our reading room, and they uh, convince them to uh, have a presentation about the books that they've worked on. And uh, I always leave it up to the staff member who has discovered the individual and their works to make that introduction. So now I'm going to ask that uh, Noah Kawar, our senior reference librarian in Arabic, come forward and uh, introduce today's speakers and program. Noah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for coming. First, I'd like to thank the Cultural, the Iraqi Cultural Center for co-hosting this event and be able to introduce our world or authors, winning authors, for this event here. OK. We will start with our uh, speaker, Ania. Ania, I never asked you how you pronounce the last name. Is it Shiazadlo? That's no. correct, right? Ania Shiazadlo. Anya Chia Sadlo spent most of the past decade living in the Middle East, where she was special correspondent for the Christian Monitor, Science Monitor in Baghdad for 2000, from 2003 to 2004, and for the New Republic in Beirut from 2005 to 2007. 
She covers some of the biggest news stories of our time. Most of you know about them. The wars in Iraq and Lebanon, President Bashar Assad's repression in Syria, and the region's ongoing Sunni Shiite conflict. She used her years of experience to write an award-winning memoir that looked at war in the Middle East in a way that no one else had, by focusing on civilians and their daily struggles over food. The resulting book, The Day of Honey, a memoir of food, love, and war, from the Free Press 2011, was widely praised by national outlets like the Washington Post, NPR, and the New York Times, describing it, and I quote, I am among, this book was considered among the least political and most intimate and valuable to have come out of the Iraqi war. The book will be available for anybody interested at the end of this talk. Her book, Day of Honey, has won multiple awards, including the American Book Award, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, nonfiction runner-up, and the Books for a Better Life Award for first book. It has been translated into Italian, Polish, Portuguese, and Dutch. Tia Sadlio, writing on culture, politics, and the Middle East, has also appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Times Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Granta, and The Nation. She lives in New York with her husband, <coughs> and she had her education from, in journalism, masters in journalism, from New York University, and at present she resides in Chicago. Without further ado, Ms. Ania. And, and feel free to jump in if you have a question at any point. I do not usually speak very formally because it's boring. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to start uh, by talking about a few things, um, and, and then I'll move on to talking about um, my book in Iraqi food, but if at any point anyone has a question, please, I encourage you to just jump right in, okay? Um, most books look at history as a series of wars. This is how history has always been taught. I prefer to look at history as a series of meals. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm going to start off in that vein by just describing a meal. Um, and first of all, I'm going to start by describing the table, and this is, this is from a book. There is a wonderful English way of setting a table, which we don't notice at home because we see it so often. The cloth droops almost to the ground, decently covering the table's legs, and it generally has ironed creases in it. The knives and forks are set with precision, not with Gallic inconsequence or Latin fire, and the cruet is given a place of honor beside a bottle of sauce. Tumblers, the right size for half a pint of ale, stand to the right hand, and inside each one is popped a little bishop's mitre, a folded table napkin. No other nation sets a table like that. And when I saw all those tables looking so English, reminding me of country hotels in Hampshire and Yorkshire and Devonshire, of little restaurants run by tall, gray-haired gentlewomen in select seaside places, a feeling of love for this dear country of ours filled my heart, and I determined to pour Lee and Perrin's sauce over everything that night, out of sheer love for England. The year of this meal was 1937. The writer was Henry Vollum Morton, and the menu for the meal at this superbly English table was the following. Tomato soup, fried fish, tartar sauce, roast beef, horseradish sauce, that's spelled with like a little apostrophe between the, a little uh, hyphen between horse and radish, roast potatoes, cauliflower, Yorkshire pudding, raisin pudding with lemon syrup, fruit, and coffee. The place where Morton was eating this superbly English meal was Rutba, a British garrison in the middle of the Iraqi desert in Anbar province, which is, as I'm sure you all know, the heart of what we now very unsubtly refer to as the Sunni Triangle. Um, it's where the roads from Iman and Damascus converge, 
And it's probably safe to say that this kind of meal is probably not being served there at this moment in time. The British had installed a constitutional monarchy in 1921 in Iraq, um, the same year, not coincidentally, that they backed a coup in Iran next door. Um, they had imported enough colonial officials from India to establish a sort of mini Raj. Um, and one of the more interesting, one of the sort of ironies of empire was that Iraq in the British administration had come under India. It was considered for purposes of British imperial bureaucracy, it was considered part of the India thing, part of the India empire. Um, and so you had a lot of the same officers, you had a lot of the same customs, and you had the same people who had sort of created a mini England in India, bringing that same mini England to Iraq. Um, in 1927, they discovered oil in Kirkuk. Um, they had started building the Simplon Orient Express, which was going to link London and Baghdad in just eight days. Um, and so in this vein, it was not very unusual to have this sort of garrison serving this sort of meal in 1937 in the middle of Anbar province. Uh, Volum goes on to write, I invite you to look at the map, which is at the beginning of this book, and having found Rutba, to believe that this very night a meal of such superb Englishness is probably being eaten in that hut behind the fortress wall. In an age of half-belief, it is inspiring to meet that mood of stern faith, which will recognize in no part of the earth a place that cannot be made a little like home, that must, in fact, be made like home before it can be called good. Interesting thought, huh? And although we may laugh at people who go about the world taking England wherever they may be, what finer thing is there to take about the world? Um, Morton goes on to describe in exquisitely racist terms uh, the reason that this meal is so English. And if you think the Gallic fire and the Latin whatever was racist, um, you should see the rest of his book. Um, the, the person in charge of this meal and of making it all happen uh, is a chain-smoking British commandant by the name of George Bryant, who, according to Vallum, speaks uh, fluent Arabic very harshly to the Iraqi waiters. Um, uh, he, there's a point where he says, you've got to keep them up to the scratch. That's the secret. You can't let one detail escape you. And Morton himself um, actually has a rare for him burst of cultural sensitivity where he notices that the few Iraqi guests at the fort seemed uncomfortable and faintly apprehensive. At one point, Bryant takes a break from shouting at the Iraqi waiters to ask Morton if he likes the fish. Um, and Morton replies, I was going to ask you how you get fish in the middle of the desert. And uh, Bryant replies, comes from Baghdad, Tigris. Get it when the desert mail goes west. It's a bit coarse, naturally, but it's not too bad, is it? Uh, and Morton replies, well, it was not, because the poor Tigris fish, entering into the spirit of the thing, had consented to look and taste very like the fried fish with sauce tartare of more familiar places. It's fish and chips, what we now know as fish and chips in the middle of the desert. Um, Freya Stark, I don't know if any of you have heard of her, but this being the, the Near East division, I would think you probably have. She was this notorious and fascinating British intelligence agent. She was an Arabist, she spoke fluent Arabic, um, and travel writer, um, also, you know, occasional propagandist. Um, she had passed through Rutba Wells, the same garrison, seven years earlier in 1929, and viewed this whole situation from a completely different perspective, completely opposite perspective. To her mind, she was an adventuress. She wanted to experience the authentic, the genuine Iraq. Um, and she was terribly disappointed to get to Rutba and find custard and crumpets and salmon mayonnaise in the middle of the desert. She wanted the real thing. You walk into a room, she said, barely concealing her dismay, and dine on salmon mayonnaise and other refinements, including all too familiar English imports like custard and jelly. Six years later, she wrote a book to preserve the memory of the old Iraq that she loved so much, the latticed balconies, the devil worshippers, the blind holy men, before it disappeared, because it was her view that it was going to very soon disappear. Even then, under its Western makeup, the features of the Caliph's city were growing dim, she wrote about 1929, from the vantage point of the mid-1930s. Six years have passed, and the outlines are fainter still. The uniformity of progress, progress, more inexorable, the benefits of civilization, more difficult to control. In a few years, she predicted the old Iraq would be completely gone, drowned in a tide of custard and crumpets and other benefits of civilization. And yet at the same time, Stark being an intelligent woman in her own way, um, 
she sensed something indefinably not quite right about this whole scene, um, some impermanence of empire. And so she added this wonderful line, um, whether these Western floods to which all her sluices are open come to the East for baptism or drowning, it is hard to say. <laughs> I guess we all know the answer to that one and how that one turned out. Um, I came to Iraq a quarter century after Freya Stark, uh, almost 74 years to the day, actually. Followed that exact same road in October of 2003. Um, same, same road, very, very different. I remember mostly uh, lots of burned out, uh, burnt cars, um, wrecked cars. Um, I remember going very fast. I remember that our driver had a hand grenade in the glove compartment, which we didn't realize <laughs> until we got to Rutba, actually. <laughs> some, of you, some of you are nodding. Um, this was customary along that road in those days um, because there was so much banditry and, and so much thieving. And he told us this very funny thing where he, I think he meant it to be reassuring. We were like, why are you going so fast? And he was like, there's lots of Alibabas that, you know, you don't know, they could they could come and, and get us, and, you know, but, I'm, but I'm on top of it, I've got this grenade, and he pulled it out, and my husband was like, whoa. Um, my husband who was sitting right in front of the glove compartment while I was in the back, so he had the worst of it. Um, anyway, we, we survived just fine, um, uh, and, I, and I had actually read the Freya Stark book at that point, and I was like, wow, this is a, this is a really different scene. Um, she describes, she describes being upset that there are so many picnickers along that road that they're leaving bags everywhere um, and you know, ruining the serenity of the desert. So when I got to Baghdad, um, which, was, which was just a few hours later, um, I had my first meal. Um, and I remember thinking, huh, there's something not quite right about this. Um, and I describe it in the book. I won't, I won't go on at length about it. Um, because there's something a bit imperial about saying, hey, this is a city in the middle of a war. Um, what's going on? Why isn't the food good? Uh, it seemed like something a British imperial officer would say. But it seemed strange to me, after I'd been there for a couple of weeks, um, you know, Baghdad was a really interesting place in those days. There were people from all over the world. You had a country that had been essentially, for most people, walled off for about 20 years, you know, dating that sort of era of cracking down on travel from the middle of the Iraq war, which is when most of the Iran-Iraq war, is when most people said, you know, it started to become harder to get passports and to travel. Um, and so you had people from, you know, Dutch deminers to Filipina domestic workers to South African bush pilots um, coming in and out, the sort of famous corkscrew flight because they were actually flying so high above Anbar province because they didn't want to get hit by rockets that when you came to the airport, you had to sort of descend like this. Um, and you have people coming from the entire, it seemed as, as if the entire world was converging on Baghdad in those days. Um, and pretty much everyone agreed, everyone who wasn't Iraqi would, would say this thing that Iraqi food is really bad. And they would say, you know, sorry, it, it might sound ethnocentric, but it's just bad. It's just not good. And some people would say, well, it's because of the war. And some people would say, well, it's because of sanctions. And everyone sort of had their own explanation. Um, I have a lot of Lebanese and Iranian friends, and they assured me that Iraqi food has always been terrible compared to Lebanese food and Iranian food. Um, and uh, one of my Iranian friends even invoked this, uh, this, what I now know is an ancient epithet, lizard eaters. You'd be like, ah, you know, in, in Iran, we call them the lizard eaters, meaning by them, meaning not just Iraqis, but anyone from the desert, any desert Arabs, any Bedouins, basically all Arabs. Um, and I have to say, I was kind of shocked. Um, and I, and I, my husband, who is Lebanese, um, was one of the few people who sort of never bought this whole line. And he would always, when this whole topic of Iraqi food is terrible came up, as it, as it often did, he would just very thoughtfully say, Iraqis have really good bread, and leave it at that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was always sort of his polite way of saying, like, shut up and stop being so racist. Um, so I started to think there's got to be something else going on. And partly this is my own family history, being from the Midwest. I'm from Chicago. When I moved to New York, I heard again and again that Midwestern food was really bad. And I was like, huh, that's, that's interesting, because I grew up in the Midwest. And, I think we have fantastic food. 
and they would always say, oh yeah, it's really bland and there's no spices and you know, they eat nothing but Wonder Bread. It, it was a lot of this sort of interesting talk and I was like, wow, I remember a lot of fried catfish and collard greens. I remember a lot of Amish jams and pickles. I remember a lot of soda bread and a lot of really interesting things going on in the Midwest. But if, you, if that's your idea, that's cool. You know, that's, that's fine. I remember you know, eating persimmon pudding, but if you don't want any, that's fine. I'll, I'll just keep it all to myself. And so I figured there must be, uh, in, the, in the best sort of Midwest, Mideast tradition, there must be something else going on. Um, I decided that I wanted to find out what was going on here. I decided that, you know, I'm a reporter. Uh, there's a lot of stories going on here, and I think that this is actually an important one. Um, and, and in the beginning, I, I sort of figured this must be because of sanctions, right? You know, we had a country that was, had a hard time getting anything in the country for, you know, over 10 years. This has got to be it. This has got to be the explanation. And I started interviewing people. Whenever I would interview people about politics, and most of the reporting I was doing, it was, you know, assassinations, bombings, and, you know, things like that. But I would always at the end say, hey, and you know, so what, you know, what do you think is the best Iraqi food? Like what, what's like your favorite thing? What's the best thing? And it was, it was interesting reporting wise, I was just doing it for fun, but I realized that because of that, it was changing the interviews that I was doing. It was changing the way people interacted with me. And it was also something really beautiful happening that most people were talking about things that were really depressing. Um, you know, I was talking about a family member had been killed or a bomb that had gone off, you know, unexpectedly in their neighborhood. Um, people whose husbands, sisters, brothers had been taken to Abu Ghraib, people who had been tortured. And something would happen at the end of the interview, I'd close my notebook and I would be like, what do you like to eat? What's your favorite food? What, tell me about Iraqi food. And their eyes would light up and suddenly it would give them a chance not only to be happy and to talk about something they loved, but also to be proud of Iraq. Um, and pretty much everyone I talked to was like, well, I like this thing, and there's this thing, and there's this thing. But you as a foreigner, what you have to try is muskoof. Um, and, and I heard sort of, it was one of those things you hear many different things about before you actually try it. Um, and so I heard, um, you know, it has to be done this way, it has to be done that way, it has to be done with this kind of wood, it has to be done with that kind of wood, it has to be done with... And, and, and pretty much everyone said you have to go to this place called El Mahar in Kurada, um, which was... I heard, I heard other places, and I tried other places, um, but El Mahar was always my favorite, I think, because people had this special sort of loyalty to it. And I think that had a lot to do with this particular neighborhood, which was a wonderful sort of mercantile neighborhood. It was very mixed. Um, religiously and racially, and I think that's also part of the secret of, of why it was so wonderful. Um, and without further ado, I'm just going to read you a short, very short section from my book about that experience of finding that place and that particular food. There was a phrase Iraqis were always using, the flavor of freedom. For a lot of Baghdadis, that flavor was muskuf. It was more than just a fish or a way of preparing it. The ritual of muskuf embodied a vanished place and time and way of life. Muskuf can be made anywhere. They make it in Basra or even these days in Beirut. But it is meant to be savored in the open air restaurants on Abu Nawas, the corniche along the Tigris where Iraqis used to stroll at sunset. Traditionally, the best muskuf was made from barbell, a carp like fish that Iraqis have been eating since the ancient Mesopotamian days. That is probably the poor Tigris fish that Morton is looking down on in his book, by the way. Um, and it's delicious. Um, Muskoof's flavor also came from the hour of anticipation while you waited for your fish. During that hour, people would eat, drink, gamble, and talk. Girls and boys would stroll up and down the corniche, laughing and making eyes at one another. Mothers and fathers would rent boats and float up and down the moonlit river, drinking in the sound of music and laughter over water, the flickering fires, the smell of roasting fish from the river bank. The important thing on Abu Nawas was drinking arak, explained Salam, the young communist I had met at a friend's journalism class, who had become a good friend and eating meze like jajik while you waited for your fish to be done. Abu Nuwas had its heyday in the 1950s and 60s when the city rented out small plots along the riverfront every summer. Families would take them for the season and set up temporary wooden ramadas with woof, roofs woven out of river reeds. On hot summer nights, everybody would head for the riverfront to talk, play the oud, take boat rides, and eat muskuf. Some people said muskuf, jump in any time, really, honestly, if you guys have your own memories. I'm just saying what people told me. Um, some people said Muskuf was imported by the Ottomans. Others maintained it was a Babylonian tradition, thousands of years old. 
Muslims claimed it was a Christian fish, thousands of years old again, the Christian taste for fish being well known. Christians whispered to me that it was a specialty from the old Jewish quarter along the river, the Jewish affinity for fish, they said, being well known. Some believed it had come from the Mandians, the Mandian love for the river and its waters being, of course, well known. I found this incredibly frustrating. I wanted facts and dates and documents and scholarly references and not this mash of exoticized nostalgia. Everybody talked about Musgoof, but nobody seemed to know where it came from. Etymology was no help. As with many Arabic dishes, its name describes the form of the dish more than its contents. Musgoof means the ceiling of one from Sa'af. Sa'af, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my, my Arabic's very Lebanese. Uh, which means ceiling, which is, struck me as like this very poetic description of the fish spread out over the fire like a roof of a little ramada. Ancient Sumerian tablets mention fish touched by fire, and Noel will tell you more about that. An ambiguous phrase, right? Touched by fire, what does that mean? Um, Herodotus wrote that three Babylonian tribes lived on a fish alone, but according to his de detailed description, they dried their fish in the sun, pounded it in mortars, and made it into cakes or a kind of bread. Um, which seems strange, but I actually met people from southern Iraq who told me that they still do that, um, which I was amazed by, but never got a chance to try. Yeah? Yeah? Someday, inshallah. <laughs> Pedro Teixeira, um, this is one of the more interesting books that I found, a Portuguese merchant adventurer. He traveled through Baghdad in 1604. And he has a wonderful description of a coffee shop, which is in a different part of my book. Um, he noted that fish are plentiful and good, and the Moors use them. But uh, the usual, usually, he's usually very detailed in this case. He didn't, he didn't say anything more about how the Moors, as he said, um, use the fish. And so all, all the sources that I found, they would, they would reference fish, but nobody would have this sort of detailed description that would, that would allow me to verify, like, this really is Muscoof. You know, which for a sort of scholarly standard, for a journalistic standard, which is what I you know, wanted to bring to bear on this, like you need to have that. Um, so I decided I would just find out as much as I could about the sort of the larger story of Iraqi food. In Iraq, as everywhere, food was an instant geographic indicator. There was the famous black pickle of Najaf, in Turshi, made with date syrup. <laughs> yeah. They have it in Dearborn. I was just there and I was like, hey. Um, the tiny delicate okra of Hilla the tender and juicy kebabs of Fallujah. There was a kind of oven-roasted lamb that is a specialty not just of Basra, but of one particular family in Basra. This culinary GPS system often overlapped with sect. And this is a quote from an Iraqi man I met. I can enter an Iraqi house and from the food, I can tell if they're a Sunni or Shiite. This is what he said, I'm just saying what he said. I'm not saying that Sunnis don't make Shiite dishes or vice versa, but you do have certain foods that are associated with certain places. That's what he said. Um, Maskoufa was one of those dishes. Everyone would always, huh? I don't agree. I don't agree. But, but I heard this from many people. <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's the nation of Moscow, right? Yeah. yeah, and in a sense, that's the point of my book, but I think it's interesting to note that people will say that. And it, it's, a, it's an interesting point of view, right? And it gets us back to this point. It gets us back to Henry Vallemorton, right? And this, you know, only England eats this way. It's this way of looking at food as being nationality or identity that is really, really interesting. I find it fascinating and, and, and Pretty much every country has this. We see this here, right? Remember when the Iraq War um, first began? Do you remember the whole thing about freedom fries? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and we just had another recent example, but I won't go into that. Um, Americans were just as nationalist when it comes to our food. Um, in Iraq as everywhere, food was an instant geographic indicator. Um, Abu Nawaz Street, Muscouf might be made in other cities, but its soul was still in Baghdad. It's got, it got its flavor from the Tigris, even when the fish never touched its waters, and from Abu Nawaz Street. Abu Nuwa Street was named after the 8th century poet. He was a companion of the Caliph Al-Amin, son of Harun al-Rashid, the storied Caliph of the Arabian Nights, nicknamed the father of locks for his luxuriant hair. Abu Nuwas was a bisexual bon vivant, famous for his khamriyat, or wine songs, hymns in praise of wine, and the nights he spent drinking it with beautiful girls and boys. He was the patron poet of bars and drinking and unrepentant freedom. Accumulate as many sins as you can, he wrote once because when judgment day arrives and you see how forgiving and gracious God is, 
You'll gnaw your fingers with regret at all the fun you didn't have. So drink the wine, though forbidden, for God forgives even grave sins. The nomadic bards of pre-Islamic Arabia padded their poems with grandiose invocations like the famous Kifa Nebki halt and let us weep. They wept over the abandoned campsite, the spot in the desert where the caravan of their lovers had once stopped and the romance of endless travel. The formula persisted long after poetry moved to the cities and in medieval Baghdad, citified poets who wouldn't know a camel if it bit them in the behind were still invoking the cold campfire, the traces in the sand and the lost lady love. Abu Nawas mastered the old nomadic form first, and then he updated it with a parody more suited to modern urban life. This wretch stopped to talk to an abandoned campsite, he wrote, while I paused to ask what happened to the neighborhood tavern. How are we for time? We're done? Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Um, thank you very much. And now, Noel, I just want to say briefly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take up a little bit of your time. My entire understanding of Iraqi food was changed so radically once I found Nawal's book, which wasn't until after I left Baghdad, ironically enough. <laughs> and everything that I'd been sort of struggling to understand suddenly was like, oh my God, here's this amazing scholarship of someone who, who knows all the sources, who knows all the origins, who can tell me exactly how all these things came about, or at least as close as can be verified. So, Thank you, Ania, very much for this interesting talk. And now to our next speaker, Nawal Nasrallah. <clears throat> Nawal Nasrallah is a native of Iraq, born in Baghdad. She received her MA in English and Comparative Literature from Baghdad University and worked as a professor at universities of Baghdad and Mosul, teaching English language and literature until 1990, when she moved with her family in the, to the US, residing at present in New Hampshire. Mrs. Nasrallah is an independent scholar and food writer, dedicating most of her time in spreading the word about the legacy of the Iraqi cuisine and its culture. By writing, translating key medical culinary text, and giving public talks about it, often coupled with cooking demonstrations of medieval and contemporary dishes. The first edition of her book, Delights from the Garden of Eva, Eden, a book on the Iraqi cuisine, was self-published in 2003. It received a great deal of attention and became a bestseller with the result that on April 2, 2003, the New York Times published a full page about it in the food section. On April 2, 2003, the book was featured in the Boston Herald, on April 21, 2003, an interview was conducted with NPR News and in Newsweek, among others. In 2007, the book received the Gourmand World Cookbook Special Jury Award. An illustrated hardback, new editions of this book, fully revised and updated, has recently been released this year by Equinox Publishing. Her other books, entitled Dates, Global History 2011. She also co-authored a book entitled Beginners Iraqi Arabic Language, right? Yes. With two audio CDs in 2006. So anybody who is learning Arabic can get to her CDs. Her English translation of 10th century Baghdad author Ibn Sayyar al warraqs cookbook entitled Annals of the Caliph's Kitchens from Brill 2007 was awarded the Gourmand World Cookbook Awards in the category Best, I'm quoting, Best Translation in the World, and Best of the Best Gourmand Awards of the past 12 years at the Frankfurt Book Fair, October 14, 2008. And in 2007, it also received honorable mention by the Arab American National Museum Book Award. Her food-related research papers are published in scholarly books and journals, and many of her recipes featured in New York Times, Boston Globe magazine, and Food and Wine, among others. Without further ado, Mrs. Nasrallah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. I encountered the same difficulty that Anya uh, encountered when she wanted to understand the Iraqi, 
when she wanted to encounter the Iraqi cuisine because I wanted to write a cookbook and I wanted to find information about it and uh, there was almost none. And, uh, and then I thought how, unf how unfortunate that our uh, history books don't teach us about an important aspect in history which is material uh, culture of which food of course is an important aspect. Um, with the result that we only have a, a flat image of what we eat. Uh, and the, our collective memory, I mean, you ask people, they don't remember. I mean, our collective memory doesn't take us more than, you know, the uh, recent uh, pre-modern uh, times. We actually have no recollection of what happened throughout the centuries before that. And it was, uh, you know, you, you do not find it in any uh, books. And, um, you know, I still remember how thrilled I was when we were, you know, school, uh, kids at school, and uh, uh, we read uh, that Zirya was the, you know, he's the singer, uh, uh, the famous Baghdadi singer who fled to Andalusia. Um, he was the inventor of Zalabia. Uh, Zalabia is a dessert we all love, you know, and, uh, and, and cherish. Um, at the time, we all loved it, you know, this juicy nugget of information. We needed more of that, but, uh, you know, we, we did really, you know, it was just uh, um, history as usual, you know, war and peace, you know, like, and leaders and, uh, and all that. Um, so with the, uh, with the result that, of course, you know, when people ask us, what is the Iraqi cuisine, we, really, we, we don't know what to say. I mean, uh, we just have, a, you know, a, a very general image. So when I did my research, I was amazed, you know, to discover that um, the, 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 this, you know, the, the, the many historical layers, you know, uh, behind our cuisine. Um, I discovered that there was a 10th century Baghdadi cookbook written by Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq. It's a whole volume, a huge one, 132 chapters of, of whatever was cooked at the time. It was an anthology of, uh, uh, of, uh, recipes written by, you know, caliphs, by princes, by uh, professional cooks. About uh, he, he mentions about uh, more than 20 cookbooks. The book has about six, more than 600 copies. Uh, not only that, uh, you know that we, we we all know that we love pictures, photos in cookbooks. And uh, Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq, of course, at the time there were no cameras. So what he did is what he gathered whatever was available to him of food poetry. He would give you a recipe and after that, a poem describing this, this food. It is the equivalent of a, you know, another way of, a pre you know, representation. So I translated it, and it's, it's a huge book. and. Uh, took a lot of time, but every minute of it was worth it. Um, and that was the first time. Uh, but remember, um, I, it, it came out only in 2007. So all this time, people really were not aware uh, of this. Another cookbook, but that was known earlier. Uh, it was discovered, Kitab al by uh, al-Baghdadi. It was... Uh, uh, the, the manuscript was discovered by a scholar uh, Dawood Chelebi when he was in Istanbul. He, uh, he, he edited it, and immediately, four years later, an, an English translation came out by uh, AJ, the scholar, the Orientalist AJ Arbery. So that was really the only book that got immediate attention. And not only that, I also discovered that our history, our cooking history, documented cooking history, goes back to uh, ancient times. Um, three cuneiform tablets were discovered. They were written in 1700 BC. That was the Babylonian times. And uh, uh, of course, they were excavated in the 1930s. But because you know, uh, they thought that they were pharmaceutical uh, uh, documents. They were left in a drawer until the uh, French Assyriologist, uh, he found it, he deciphered it, and his discoveries came out in the 1980s, also late, relatively late. Um, I'll talk about these later, but let me tell you that this, uh, this uh, uh, cuneiform tablet is about stews, marga. And we know how uh, important stew is in the Iraqi cuisine. 
The, the, uh, the second uh, cuneiform tablet deals with uh, bird pies. Can you imagine that 1700 BC people cooked pies? And they you know, filled them with uh, bechamel sauce, white sauce. I mean, what is bechamel sauce? White sauce. Um, the third, there was a third cuneiform tablet, but it was dam uh, badly damaged. But I was also able to find you know, two juicy nuggets. First of all, is that they used to mix meat with bread, with, with dough, and bake it, which is exactly like what we call kubzarug. We mix uh, uh, meat, chopped meat, with, uh, with dough, and we bake it. Another thing is I discovered they used nuts in their cooking. They added nuts, which is also a very typical Middle Eastern thing to do. We like to add raisins and nuts to our, uh, to our dishes. This is a typical of all the uh, cooking of all the region. Um, the way I, I, I mean, I thought about uh, my presentation, and I thought the best way to handle this is by food categories. I mean, uh, that's the, I, th I thought this is the, you know, um, will be more interesting. So what's base, more basic than bread? Um, and we are, all the Iraqis are familiar with the tanur bread. It is the flat bread with the lovely bubbles on top because they are uh, baked in the tanur. Um, the tanur is a domed clay oven. And because of its shape, because the dough is relatively uh, kind of wet, um, uh, so some lovely bu bubbles uh, can be, you know, uh, created on top. This is the typical Iraqi bread. And um, we have evidence that uh, the Sumerians, like, uh, you know, five, uh, more than 6,000 years ago, they cooked, they, they baked it. Even the gadget itself, the oven itself, they called it tenuru. We call it now tenur. And one of the tanur, similar to what we uh, you know, have nowadays, was really ex excavated. So that's, that, that's a fact. Not only that, they also made, we, record, according to records, they made about 300 types of bread, different kinds, different shapes, simple, like the tanur bread, um, rich bread. They add to it sam, samnu, what they call samnu, which is sam, clarified butter. Uh, they add to it uh, cheese. Uh, you know, you, you, you name it. Uh, we have remnant of recipes of cakes, like fruit cakes. They added dried fruits. And they even used molds. This is um, uh, uh, an ancient mold, bread mold, where they used to uh, put the dough. And then when it comes out, it comes out with this beautiful impression on top of it. Uh, this is a, a medieval miniature where you have people uh, having uh, uh, this is a, a feast, a wedding feast, and people are having food. And you notice that if you notice the sufra, the, 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 the dishes, you notice all around the table there are folded uh, breads. Bread is essential, and uh, of course, it continued until today. Uh, there is a, a, a funny story about, uh, about uh, you know, in medieval times, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the medieval, now, now, now we leave the Sumerians and we come to medieval times during time of the Abbasids. They also made uh, many kinds of uh, bread, but two types stand out. First of all, the rokaq bread. Rokaq is what the uh, Lebanese, for example, the Syrians nowadays call mar'u, or the Armenians call lawash. It is thin, flat bread. And they also made tanur bread. They called it khubz al ma, water bread. I, I know that even nowadays, this same bread, we call it khubz mai, which is water bread, because it's very simple. Nothing, you know, just water, bread, yeast, salt, and that's it, very basic. But the, what, uh, the, the flat bread, the, uh, the thin, they call it uh, ruqaq, the thin bread, was uh, really became the epitome of urbanity, of civilization, of uh, sophistication. That was the sophisticated uh, bread. And they tell the story of a Bedouin uh, who went to a wedding party like this one, like the one you see. And uh, he wasn't, of course, he, he didn't know this kind of, uh, you know, uh, refined bread. So he said, as I was sitting, I saw people 
as, uh, distributing pieces of a cloth. And I liked it, and I wanted to make a shirt from it. So as I was asking my, the people around me to give me their uh, share so that I make this shirt, they started tearing it to pieces. So he discovered this kind of uh, you know, sophisticated bread. Not only that, of course, bread leads us to, co bread leads us to cookies. Um, like a kletcha, we are all familiar with the kletcha. If you are Iraqis, you know that this is our national cookie. But uh, very, you know, I don't think people realize how ancient this cookie is. It goes back to ancient Mesopotamian times where they called it qulupu. It was round, it was made, like nowadays, it was made to celebrate religious festivals, um, specifically the festival of Ishtar, goddess Inanna, uh, which uh, coincides with the beginning of spring, the new year, Nowruz, uh, Easter. And it was called Kulupu because they made it round, like the moon. Sometimes they make it a crescent, you know, take, it takes the, the, the different shapes of the moon, and they filled it with dates, like we do nowadays. In case we think there is a gap between ancient times and modern times, we ha when, we, when, we, when you read those uh, medieval cookbooks, uh, we also come across exactly the same cookies, but the different name. They were called Khushkananaj. Of course, at the time, during medieval times, it was the fashion to call their na the names by the, you know, by their, by the, to, to call them in, in Persian, because that was, you know, the style. You know, like, like Persian style, Istanbul style, it was the Persian style. So they called them khushkananaj, which simply means dry bread, because those cookies were not too, uh, too soft. Uh, people who go to Hajj, they can take a bag full of those cookies and you know, they sustain themselves for a, for a long while. So klecha, uh, I think it's called kuluche uh, in, in Iranian. And Ibn Battuta, when he visited Khurasan in the 14th century, he mentions Kalicha. Well, of course, I read, I read it as Kalicha in Arabic, but we, we pronounce it as Kalicha and Kuluche. It's the same thing. He mentioned it exactly the same description. So here we have a, a, a unique case of a continuous dish that you can trace, documented from ancient times to the, to the present. This doesn't happen very often, by the way. Related to bread, of course, sandwiches. And sandwiches, of course, if you go to Iraq, you know that sandwiches are very important to us. We call them sandwich. Or, uh, of course, the traditional laffa, which means the roll-up. Laffa, the roll-up. But this is not the invention, of course, if you think that uh, uh, Lord uh, Montague, uh, what was his name, Montague, uh, who he, that the, if the British uh, Lord who invented the, uh, the sandwiches, that's not true. Uh, med you know, people in medi Arabs in medieval times, they had their own set of sandwiches, so they made them even before uh, the 18th century in, in Europe. The, in medieval times, in those cookbooks I found, we have about 14 recipes of sandwiches. But of course, names, you have to be, to, to, to be wary of names. The names, they change, and uh, that's why you know, sometimes they escape your attention. Um, the, the, the first type is basmawart, which is a roll-up, and the second is awsat. It's just, you open up a bread, you empty out, you know, take out the pith, you fill it, you press it, and you divide it into sections, and you eat it, exactly like we do nowadays. Here we have two, uh, these are the, 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 the recipes I translated into English taken from the medieval cookbooks. One, the first example in, on Basma word, and the second is on Awsat. Of course, we don't have the time now to read it, but they are there. There's a proof for this. Of course, nowadays, when we make sandwiches, we use Samun. Uh, Samun, is nothing else than what in medieval times was called khubuz furrani. Because the, uh, the thin breads, the flat breads, were baked in the tanur. <clears throat> khubuz furrani was baked in the commercial brick oven. And of course, 
when they, uh, when they were baked as such, they tend to be, they puff, they are pithy, and you can open them up and fill them with something, you know, exactly like shabata bread or all those, uh, you know, French bread, the same idea. So Samun nowadays is a descendant of Khubis Furrani, but we call it Samun. And Samun, of course, is a, a loan word, Samun from uh, uh, Turkish, which means, you know, bread, general. It's a general word for uh, brick oven bread. Now we come to Mezguf. Anya talked a lot about Mezguf. Foreigners, of course, the first thing they know is about is, is Mezguf. I mean, uh, that's the first thing uh, they, uh, you know, they, uh, they are introduced to. I think uh, Mezguf is a, tip, is, a, you know, is a Baghdadi dish, but it also has its um, uh, origins in Mesopot ancient Mesopotamian times, because when you read the records describing how fish was cooked, um, they said uh, fish was first licked by the fire. When does the fire lick food? When it flares. And then fish is laid on the fire. Of course, we know when you cook uh, mesguf, it goes into two stages. Um, this is the river Tigris in medieval times, just to show you that uh, it's a, a typically Tigris, river Tigris fish. And uh, they, they cook this, they bake this dish along the banks of the river. Um, exactly, they use, uh, I mean, generally they use shabut and bunni. These are the two types of bread, they, uh, of, of fish they used. When you go to the, to, to for mesguf, you don't buy dead fish. You have to buy it alive, like people do nowadays when they uh, buy a lobster. You have to pick your fish and then they open it up for you. And then they, uh, you know, they uh, impale the fish, they make two slashes, and they impale it on uh, pieces of wood, and you see the fire licking the fish, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, stage. I think mesguf, of course, it is related to saqaf, which is roof, but, uh, you know, when you read the, descri the description of the uh, verb saqafa in the uh, medieval, uh, uh, dictionaries, it, it, it actually means suspended, you know, or impaled. So th exactly like this fish is, is doing here. And there you go. This is the finished fish for you, ready to eat. Ah, lovely. <laughs> uh, but of course, that's only one of the, uh, the you know, the, the, the the grilled fishes, this is not everyday uh, food. I think Anya ate more, than, more mesguf than I did m my whole life. <laughs> it's expensive, it's not available, so, <laughs> so she enjoyed it better, perhaps more than I did. What we do eat for our daily meal is rice and stew, timmanu marga. If they say here, America runs on donuts, we say Iraqis run on Timmanu Marga. I think that cuisine started with the perfection of the art of making stew. Because with the stew, I mean, with the grilling, you don't, you don't have that many possibilities. But with the stew, the, the sky is the limit. There is no end to the things you put to the... Uh, you know, to, to put into the pot, the, the pieces of lamb, the pieces of, uh, of the vegetables, the spices. And this art was perfected during the ancient times, the Babylonian times exactly. This is the, the first cuneiform tablet I show you, 1700 Babylonian tablet. It deals with recipes of stew. These are three recipes taken from the cuneiform tablet as deciphered by the Jean Botero, the French assyriologist. You, of course, you notice that they, um, you know, they include meat, sometimes different kinds of meat. Uh, spices were added, but not all of at once. You know, like a, a true cuisine, you add it at stages as needed. They all contained garlic, uh, onion, and the leeks. But not all of them were uh, without, you know, some of them were with just meat, some of them were with meat and vegetables, and one of them was just, what was just turnips, you know, like a vegetarian turnip stew. 
And you notice that in all those recipes, there, are, there is the direction and add fat. And uh, if you are familiar with Iraqi cooking and or, or all Middle Eastern cooking, you know that, you know what kind of fat they mean. It is the uh, liya, the chunk of the, uh, you know, the, the pure fat of the, <laughs> of the uh, tail of the Middle Eastern sheep. It was there from uh, ancient times. Um, there you have, you see the picture of a, of a ram pulling the tail, it is so big. Uh, this is according to Herodotus, of course. He has many exaggerations. <laughs> he, he says the, their sheep, they have tails so large that they need that cart in order to pull their tails. Um, but of course, we, we still have the same uh, sheep. The, 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 the picture of the sheep to the, to the right, this is a, a medieval uh, miniature, also showing the same uh, uh, kind of uh, sheep with the fat. Without exaggeration, Without exaggeration yeah. <laughs> and of course, when you cook a stew, um, you cook them in large pots. And I particularly like this uh, medieval miniature because it shows that uh, the, the care they took when they, uh, when they uh, prepared their stews. You see the cook is uh, covering his mouth uh, with a piece of a cloth, it was mandatory that the, uh, the cook, the stew cook, should, should do this because he is going to bend on the, on the, you know, stirring the pot a lot. And just in case, to keep the food clean, just in case he sneezes or he coughs, he has to, you know, for hygienic reasons, he has to cover his mouth. The med in the medieval, of course, the times, the, the, the art of this too was exploited, fully exploited, and with the result that we have all kinds of stew. Also, the base, their basic food, uh, plain stew, sour stew, which, in which they use vinegar. Uh, sometimes they used uh, juices of uh, sour uh, fruits, like pomegranate, uh, quince, um, unripe grapes, husrum, uh, or uh, lemon. Sweet and sour, they also had this uh, love for the sweet and sour taste, which also goes back to ancient times, because uh, we have evidence that they used apricots in, their, uh, in, one, in, 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 in certain dishes. Um, the sweet and sour, they, add, well, they, they would add uh, honey with, with, with uh, vinegar, for example. Sometimes they add sugar, sometimes in Iraqi uh, dishes, sometimes they add date syrup uh, to, to balance, so the, the, the aim was, not to, to be overly sweet, to overly uh, sour, but a balanced, uh, you know, harmonious, uh, to have harmonious uh, tastes. And this brings us, of course, to one of the dishes brought uh, today by uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, by, the, by the center, which is Fasanjun. Uh, Fasanjun is uh, the, uh, the Iranian, uh, of course, known as the in Iranian dish is the pomegranate walnut stew. But uh, this dish, you know, even before it was called Fasanjun, in medieval times it was called Romania. Uh, uh, pomegranate juice, the, 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 the stew is thickened with the crushed uh, walnut and then, of course, cooked with meat. So the dish was there, you know, cooking and uh, um, it's popular, it's delicious, that's why, you know, it's uh, popular everywhere. This is also another, uh, you see the care they took, this is a medieval uh, relic of a, a kind of gadget, cooking gadget, they called it uh, Kanun Ajlan, uh, which is a clay pot. Um, one of the recipes, for example, would, would, would require slow cooking so that the stew doesn't burn. Uh, because it's delicate, they used uh, uh, juices of uh, vegetables. How much time do I have? Okay, they use it juices of vegetables like uh, cilantro or uh, um, or, or uh, Swiss chard, and they wanted to keep it delicate. So, because this burns so sw so slowly, they used this kind of thing. Exactly the same idea, like the tagine, the Moroccan tagine, the you know the terracotta uh, pots. And of course, if you, when you come to the modern time, what's more famous than the okra uh, stew? And up until the beginning of the 20th century, it was the custom to serve those stews as tharid. 
they break pieces of bread, flat bread, no some moon, flat bread, they break it into pieces and they drench it in the, of course, in the liquid of the, of the, of the stew. But then, of course, when rice became more available, we, we switched to rice and, and the stew. But we still like to serve some of the dishes tharid. These are typical uh, modern stews. Okay, this is what we cook every day. But when, 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 when we have guests, it's another story. As we say, should do raskum ya we have to do a lot of, you know, a lot of preparations. We have to reserve the most difficult dishes for our guests. Uh, when I make, uh, when I invite people, and I, uh, you know, of course, I offer them like I do, you know, the best we have, the most elaborate dishes. They ask, "Do you cook th like this every day?" I told them, "No, I don't cook like this. I cook it for you because you are guests, and I'm supposed, of course, to." Uh, to honor you with those dishes. Of course, uh, those dishes are a, a, a chance for the, for, the, for the chef to show his, you know, pride in his cooking, showmanship. It's, a, it's, it, it's, a, it's showtime for, uh, for those. Uh. For example, this, uh, of course, we are all familiar with the stuffed uh, foods, and the, even from medieval times, we have the stuffed uh, sheep, we have stuffed chicken, and the, sometimes we have extreme cuisine where a calf is a stuffed with a sheep, the sheep is stuffed with a chicken, the chicken with, uh, with a pigeon, the pigeon, etc., 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 until you come to the egg inside. <laughs> uh, this is, of course, another uh, uh, dish which is the uh, specialty of the Kurdish people. For the pilau, it is the rice enclosed in. Uh, um, um, in, in dough, and we come to dolma, of course, the ubiquitous dolma, everybody knows dolma, but dolma, as we know, uh, of course, it, it's a loan word, um, it's a, uh, you know, it's a Turkish word, which means stuffed. Uh, in fact, you know, stuffed foods were made from uh, medieval times, we have recipes for this, I, I talk about this later. This is the typical Iraqi dolma, because Although it is dolma, not all dolmas are the same. Some of, you know, wherever you go, you find different, you know, kind of uh, regional differences. This is stuffed uh, layer of the, the specialty of the, uh, for example, if you go north, there is kubbat musl, which is the uh, flattened bulgur dough. And uh, I mean, they could have shaped it into a small ball and end it, but no, I mean, they, they want to show their skill. <coughs> And as you know, of course, here you see, in those dishes, you see the regional differences. Uh, in the north, because wheat grows abundantly, you have bulgur, so they, they have a lot of dishes. And this is uh, the, the gadget they use to make uh, kubbat mosul, because it breaks so easily, so they need special gadgets. This is uh, kubba labaniya, <coughs> also a specialty of the north, because, you know, they have, uh, uh, they, they consume yogurt more than uh, the other parts do. But as you go southwards, bulgur changes, I mean, the ingredient changes to rice. So here we have, for example, kubbat hamut shalram, which is the rice dough. We make now, now we use rice because rice is more abundant in, uh, in southern areas. Or we have kubbat halab, also you make also uh, dough from rice and stuff it, you fry it. Although it is called kubbat halab, I asked people in Aleppo, and they said, we have no idea what you are talking about. I think there's this tendency to call things, you know, to make them sound like exotic, far away, so, so that people would be interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say, <laughs> uh, when the new world brought us potatoes, of course, we made kubba with it. What, uh, what, uh, what's, what's strange about this? Whatever we touch, we make kubba. Um, now, stuffed dishes is not in the new invention of modern cooks. It goes back to medieval times where you have a revolution in the way they cook their food. There's a recipe, 13th century, of stuffed eggplant, which uh, sounds like Sheikh Mahshi, you, you know, you just stuff it with meat. But I like the last sentence. He, the, 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 the recipe says, arrange the uh, eggplants on the platter whole. You know, you make them look whole as if nothing has been done to them. You know, the aim, as if you want to surprise your uh, eaters, you want to kind of deceive them, of course, in a good way. 
uh, they will take the eggplant, they think it's, uh, there's nothing inside, but they open it up and they find something else. It's the element of pleasant surprise that, you know, that the, the cooks really are, are aiming at. Uh, of course, the meatballs, they were fond of meatballs, but this was the beginning of the meatball, of the, of the kubba, from med medieval times. They were called kubba. Uh, sometimes they filled those meatballs with something else, like mashed hummus, uh, chickpeas, or something, uh, or uh, mashed nuts. But nowadays, of course, you know, we, we developed this art. Also related to this uh, is the art of making pies. You know, this is, uh, and this is the uh, farm tablet where you have the, where, where pies are made. Um, uh, as the staff of a French, uh, when the cuneiform tablets first came out, the staff of the medieval uh, 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 tablet, they, they followed the recipe and they made this pie. Uh, there is some busa. Uh, in medieval times, which uh, later on, of course, during the Ottoman period, turned into Burag. It's the same idea, but of course, it was called Burag. Uh, Burag also, um, you know, um, became sweet and, uh, and savory. So there was lausinage in medieval times that also became baklava. I think I'm running up. But I, just, I just want five minutes, okay? <laughs> yeah. Two minutes, okay. Um, we we skip that. Okay, but desserts, of course, are quite important in uh, for for you know uh, for us, and we we love to eat desserts. There is the uh, the saying it says that the, uh, there is always a space in my stomach for dessert. And you know what? In medieval times, they thought that desserts are good for you because uh, they they followed this Galenic humoral theory, which says that uh, uh, desserts are hot. Since cooking is, uh, since cook, uh, digestion is like cooking, cooking needs heat, the stomach needs heat. So the, what do you do in order to help digestion? Eat dessert. <laughs> Good news, right? <clears throat> of course, and uh, uh, we have those uh, dates, and we have Zalabia. You remember the Zalabia I mentioned at the beginning? Uh, it was very famous, but you know what? <coughs> It turned out that it wasn't, after all, the invention of Zariab. It was called Zalabia even before he was born. <laughs> so, but it was the, you know, it was made in, it was, uh, Baghdad was famous for it, and uh, they made it. Uh, I want to end this, uh, uh, you know, presentation on a sweet note, a poem written in the ninth century about Zalabia. I saw him at the crack of dawn frying Zalabia, looking like tubes of reed, delicate and thin. The oil I saw boiling in his pan was like the hitherto elusive alchemy. The batter he threw into the pan, looking like silver, would instantly transform into lattices of gold. And that's the, how we end it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Noel, for this interesting talk. Now I want to invite Anya, please come over and we will open the floor for any questions and you can address either Anya or Noel for your inquiries. Anybody has questions? Yeah. Yes. Can you tell us about um, the dish for Jannah? Bagilla? Yeah. yeah. Where does it come from? Do you know any? Yeah, of course. I know a recipe. You know, in medieval times, uh, exactly the same recipe. You boil the dried uh, fava beans, and you soak flat bread. You know, tanur bread, and and you eat it. And it was, you know, it was uh, popular, but it was not kind of, uh, you know, classy food. You know, it was done when you are, uh, you know, kind of poor or something because it has no meat. So, uh, but it's still it's popular. Yeah. It's very similar to, to the Amharic, talking about Bagela. Yeah, yeah. Fava beans, yeah. Beans, but in the rest of the Arab world, food is yeah. 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 So I'm trying to see. Yeah, Bagela is, a, is a, I think, indigenous to, uh, to Iraq. I think it, it, it goes back to, you know, earliest times, but even in. Uh, in uh, medieval sources, it was called baqla or baqli. That's the only time. In, in, uh, in uh, dictionaries, for example, they would say, or the book on, uh, on herbs or on uh, uh, or botanics, they would say al baqla in Egypt, they would call it, uh, you know, like fool. So there were regional differences in the naming of vegetables. And you know that this is 
This belongs to this, here, this belongs there. One of my friends uh, in, in Baghdad was actually another journalist who's Ethiopian, and he was like mind blown by how many cognates there were between yeah. Iraqi Arabic and Amharic. Yeah. He yeah. was like, oh my God, I can, yeah. Yeah, like I can mm. practically talk to people here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Which one? Rice, yeah. Okay. Uh, rice, uh, it came to the region, I think, the first century, uh, uh, the, fir the first century BC, but it wasn't really that popular. The popularity, uh, I mean, we can see it being used, uh, there are recipes using it in the 10th century Baghdadi cookbook, but it was used uh, like you make harissa, you know, like porridges, uh, called uh, aruziyat. Uh, they used it to thicken uh, some of these tools, like uh, uh, turnip stew, for example. They, use, uh, you, they, they grind rice. Rice was used a lot in making uh, faludaj, which is the dessert, um, uh, uh, condensed pudding. They used a lot, you know. Uh, in, in fact, Mamunia, al Mamun, the Caliph al Mamun was fond of it, and Mamunia uh, goes back, you know, to, to, to that time. Uh, from the 10th century to the 13th century, I see a difference because in the 13th century, we start reading about ruz mufelfel. Uh, the, the recipe describes exactly how we cook rice with, with, with lamb. First of all, the meat is cooked, and then the, you use the stock in order to cook the rice. Uh, the recipe would say, you put enough stock so that when you put the ladle in the pot, it would stand. That is, you don't put a lot of water, a lot of stock. And then you leave it until uh, the, 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 the rice grains uh, become fluffy, separated. That's why it was called ruz mufelfel. Of course, sometimes wrongly translated as peppered. Uh, rice. It's not uh, peppered, it's separated, you know. We like it to be fluffy and separated. So I think rice as we know it today, you know, the sep with separated grains, it started with the 13th century and, and upwards. Uh, but of course, um, and then of course, uh, the cultivation of rice improved 19th century or so. It became, you know, quite common. Even uh, people with uh, limited means would, uh, would use rice. It's completely different in the Levant, by the way. Um, there's a saying in Levantine Arabic, Izz al-Riz wal barq al shana halu. Uh, the rice came along and the wheat hanged itself. Um, <laughs> and this was, even at the end of the 19th century, you, you still had, actually even into the 20th century, you still had people would make stuffed grape leaves and things. If you were very, very rich, you could get rice. Mm -hmm. But most people would make it with barq wheat, Burgle, with bulgur yeah. wheat. Yeah, um, it was kind of a status symbol, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, but now, of course, it's, it's, it's a different story. Now everyone uses yeah, this for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have one more last question and then everybody is invited to lunch. We'd like to thank the cultural, Iraqi Cultural Center for bringing us food today. And at the same time, I want to mention they have a program in the Cultural Iraqi Center in connection with anybody. Anybody interested, you can consult one of the staff members here from the Cultural Center. And you can ask us <laughs> Mesgouf, Mesgouf, <laughs> Mesgouf, you know, the, gr <laughs> the grilled fish. <laughs> the grilled fish, Mesgouf. <laughs> Any more questions? No? Okay. All invited back to lunch. Okay. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.